Hello, I'm Sue Stockdale, and welcome to episode 134 of the Access to Inspiration podcast. Well, I'm delighted to say we've saved an amazing story for our series finale today, and it's likely to make you laugh and possibly cry, as it's deeply personal and inspiring all at the same time. Our guest today is David Smith, who was recommended by Sarah Gilchrist, a previous guest from episode 87. Sarah introduces David who has an impressive background in sports, including winning a gold medal at the 2012 London Paralympic Games. Despite facing a subsequent medical issue with a tumour and then paralysis, David's resilience and inspirational approach to adversity shines through in this conversation. I'm sure you'll find his story not only insightful, but motivational, and it gives a deeper understanding for us all of how to appreciate life. You can read a transcription of this episode as you listen along at our website, accesstoinspiration.org. Welcome to the podcast today, Sarah and David. And Sarah, maybe if I can come to you first, you're a previous guest on the podcast. In fact, you were in episode 87 on managing sleep. And welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Now you brought along a guest today to have as our guest for this podcast, David Smith. Tell us about David then. Well, David and I have known each other a long time. I was support staff for British Rowing during the Beijing, London, Rio Olympic and Paralympiads. And Dave was involved in the Paralympic rowing team. So I've known Dave a long time, but his pedigree in sport goes back way before that. He's been involved in numerous sports, Dave, I think, it's from karate, athletics, bobsleigh, you name it. But he arrived with us in the para rowing team around about 2009, Dave, I think it was. Went on to be highly successful in the crew boat and winning world champs a couple of times and then gold medal at the 2012 London Paralympic Games. During this time, unfortunately, he found a tumour in his neck and he underwent surgery. And so my reason for bringing Dave to the podcast today is not only is he an incredible sports person, which during this summer of Olympic and Paralympic sport is obviously a good talking point. He's hugely inspirational in his approach to the adversity that he's faced with his medical issue and just the way in which he manages himself around repeat surgeries and his rehab. And I just think everything that he brings to the table is incredibly inspirational, but also very insightful. And I think it'd be great to hear what he has to say today. Well, welcome, David. And what a wonderful introduction there from Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue, and, and thank you, Sarah, for such a lovely introduction. And yeah, th- it, we've been through quite a turbulent journey. Uh, just preparing for an Olympics or Paralympics is emotional enough, but when you're diagnosed with a tumour in the key stages of that preparation, it adds such a multifaceted, dimensional layer of emotions uh, to the whole picture. And actually, Sarah was part of the diagnosis team, I remember, back we first started to monitor my sleep because my training was really starting to fall off and really sport for me has always been a very simple equation you get out what you put in and I was putting all this what I perceived as very disciplined work in but the performances and outcomes and on a measurable level weren't matching the equation of what I was putting in and we started to dig a little bit deeper and between Sarah and Pat Dunleavy the physio at the time we pretty much found something that I would say we went on to find something that would define my life but ultimately is probably going to be the thing that takes my life so it's been quite an emotional journey that I thought when I first came to Paralympic sport was going to be the start of going to multiple games and multiple medals and actually it became all about tumors and surgeries and this existential thing and it took me down a much deeper path of philosophy and psychology and the meaning of life than I'd hoped for but out of it all I hope I've made some difference to the people around me where it's not become about me trying to win medals I guess my philosophy now has changed massively about well how do I make the world just a better place through my understanding of 14 years on cancer wards and neurosurgery wards and everything I've seen there and I always lived by the philosophy that sport gave me the mindset and the physiology to deal with cancer and paralysis but those two lessons gave me a much deeper understanding how to live. Wow what an introduction and giving us the backstory. So David you said there that you've learned how to cope with life in a different way and I just wonder given that it was because you were monitoring your body and your health in detail because of the high performance sport that you were involved in 
that actually that helped uncover the diagnosis perhaps more quickly than would have been otherwise. I don't know if you ever reflect on that. I do actually. I reflect on it massively because I think if it had only been one diagnosis and one surgery, then possibly not. I think I would have probably just got on with the rest of my life. But I'm on to surgery number seven. It's been 14 years now. So I've got quite a lot of uh, psychological mileage, I guess, in this environment. So I do often reflect massively on it, not because of my own journey, but the people I meet. Usually when you're sitting in a waiting room, you're sat with either two types of people. You're sat with someone who is very aware of their journey. They've been on their journey. They've had their surgery, either in radio or chemotherapy. So they've been on that journey for some time. Or you have somebody, it's their first day in the waiting room and they're yet to be diagnosed. And they're only there with the symptom of maybe headaches or blurred vision or whatever the symptom may be they're facing. So you're constantly having these discussions with people and how they found their tumor. And ultimately, the one thing I realize is that early diagnosis is literally the difference between potentially living and not living. So the one thing with an athlete is we're so in tune with our body on an introspective level, but also we have all of this data collection around all the parameters that are going on in sport. And actually, when I was first diagnosed, I guess external data collection was not where it is today. We have all of these devices now that are tracking heart rate variability and sleep and we can do it now almost at home. Now, debatable Sarah will tell me how accurate these machines are, but I guess it, it does provide a slight insight into the body and the physiology. But I think that being an athlete, being in tune with your body, I felt right away that I knew something wasn't right, but I never suspected for one minute it would be a tumor on the first diagnosis. But every time since then, over the last 14 years, I almost knew intuitively that it had come back just from very, very slight changes in my body, which ultimately meant I could get to my surgeons, get a scan and be treated extremely quickly before it starts to grow and, and potentially metastasize, which makes it a much more complex surgery. So I think, yes, being in tune with the body is key. I do think sports people maybe have an inherent bias that they are a little bit more in tune, but I've also met athletes during my time that don't know their elbow from their thumb. So I guess that it's personal to each individual. I think you make a really good point there, Dave. I think in rowing particularly, the athletes are certainly more in tune in their bodies than in other sports that I'd work with just because of the nature of the programme, the culture of the sport. There is a lot of emphasis placed on the data that was collected, but you can't ignore the human side of it and how you feel. And it's that point you raise about the technology we were using at the time were active watches, which were laboratory grade in field sleep monitors. This was before smartwatches, smartphones and all of the sleep gadgets and gizmos that you can get now. What actually alerted us on the sleep was the fragmentation index, which is a marker of your restlessness and you perhaps remember I was saying to you your restlessness is off the scale I was in the realms of gathering normative data on athletes but didn't necessarily exist at the time and that was where my interest was in not just the individual athletes I was working with but getting normative data on these sleep parameters and it was because you were up in the night going to the loo because it was you know, when we saying it was pressing on your bladder nerve wasn't it so what alerted us to something isn't right and then obviously the neurophysiology side of things and with the physio working in the referral led thankfully to that diagnosis so something could be actioned but I do wonder if you had now the sleep trackers that they have now your fragmentation index they don't measure that it would have given you a marker of your quality of sleep but it wouldn't necessarily have told us the information that we had off the active watches other than the fact that you would know yourself you're getting up multiple times in the night to go to the toilet. Still, the technologies that are available now, the accuracy and some of the things that they can measure are better, but they're still not laboratory grade. But I do wonder if you had the technologies that are available now in terms of the ability to measure in the home what we were measuring through scientific equipment, whether we would have picked things up even earlier. We'll never know that. But it's an interesting point. I've never actually thought about that until you said it. And the fact that technologies have moved on you may have had your own gadgets and gizmos that could have alerted it to something even earlier yeah it's interesting right and i think that's the benefit of the support team because as an individual and an athlete i was in denial i think i'm still in denial 14 years on that i don't want to have a tumor so maybe i would have ignored the data and just sort of plowed on anyway and thought well it's due to training it's due to maybe just not sleeping well 
And I wouldn't have really looked at the numbers because you don't want to be diagnosed. And there's times over the last 14 years, I've not wanted to go for a scan because I've thought, oh, I, I can't deal with what this may show. But I think that's the beauty of having that support system around you at that time, especially within GB Rowan, because there was everyone there and people are having almost a helicopter view of the athletic performance so they can step back and deal with it maybe in a more rational sense where when it's happening to you, your first response is to go straight to an emotional, irrational response <laughs> and be quite reactive to it all and, and not think clearly. So I think that's the environment in sport. I mean, you, you don't want to be diagnosed anywhere, but to be diagnosed within a sporting environment was actually probably the best place for me to be diagnosed because I had that massive network of people to fall back on. So given that there's a support system that's around you in sport, Dave, when then your capability, your ability to continue on in that sport gets diminished through tumour and, and your situation subsequently, does the sport support system still exist or have you had to find support elsewhere? Yeah, well, you know, in an ideal world, it would be great if it did, but there's obviously thousands of current athletes who need that system. <laughs> so I was lucky, I think, because very early on, before I came on to British Show, and I pretty much managed my own program. So I learned a lot. I learned usually things not to do correctly. So, But I built up a massive base of information and learning, and I have a love of learning. I wasn't an athlete who just turned up and trained. I actually really wanted to understand why we were doing things, why are we doing certain sessions, what does this data mean? So I took a great interest in it, and also my first degree at at Bath University was in sports science and performance. And then I did a master's in psychology and a diploma in applied neuroscience. So I realized that I wanted to become a student of my mind body, not just my craft. I really wanted to delve into that. And that's really paid off massively for me because I'm not on a national team anymore. So I rely fully on the NHS or private to fulfill all of my needs. And I have quite complex needs because I have a incurable growing tumor in my spinal cord at C4. I have a ton of damage in the spinal cord from C2 to C6, which has created all sorts of biomechanical problems, spinal cord issues. Then there's the psychology cost to all of that as well. So I've recreated the sports system in my own little world. And everything that I did through rehab number one, I did five surgeries, I think it was, within the British sporting system. I used to just listen to all the people that were around me and I wrote everything down that I've ever done. I've kept all my rehab journals. So when I go back to surgery now, I know how to prepare for the surgery mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, taper into it. And then when I wake up in the ICU, I know the first things to do because I've done it now for 14 years and I got all of the information, I guess, that I got in surgery one was from all of Britain's leading sports psychologists, physiologists, nutritionists, strength coaches. So I have all that information, even though I'm not working with them directly, I'm still using that information to this day. Sounds like it was a great education that's helped you to thrive as best you can today. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, I'm not going to say it's all great days. I probably struggle more now mentally and physically that I've ever struggled and it would be amazing to be in that system and have the motivation to show up to rehab it's, it's extremely hard internally to find the drive to rehab for four or five hours every day when you're just on your own and the outcome is not a medal or a selection spot on a national team I guess the outcome is bigger it's life it's to live but it is extremely hard when you're doing everything on your own from a financial side point of view, but also just from an internal motivation to wake up in the morning and be able to say, right, you need to show up today. What's driving you to show up, to get out the door, to get to a gym? We were very spoiled as athletes. We had our own gyms. We had our own Pilates studios. We had everything at a world-class level, and we didn't have to share it with maybe like 200 bodybuilders so now I have to go to the gym and share it with everybody else that's sometimes quite hard to do so I look back and think wow that was a very special time and I'm blessed to have had that because I realized that 99% of the people that I sit on the cancer wards with they don't have access to that they've never had access to that so I could sit now and get frustrated with my current situation not having access to that but I feel very blessed that for most of my 
tumor journey, I've had access to the world leading cutting edge sports science that I wouldn't say it's kept me alive, but it's given me the highest quality of life in a situation where it could have been a lot worse. Wow, Dave. The other people that you meet on your journey in the cancer wards, they don't have these tools that you have. Does it take a lot of energy because you're a great guy, you want to help people as well, and I know you would have imparted knowledge to other patients around you, but again, that's taking energy from you. You Is there ever a point where you're like, so much more could be done for these other patients from your experiences in terms of what's helped you? But you have to concentrate on your own rehab, but then the energy it might take to help advise other patients, which I know you love to learn and you love to impart that knowledge. I can see you having those conversations with other patients and that's energy sapping in itself. Yeah, that's a great question. And so I think this is probably something I've learned massively over the 14 years. So my first few surgeries, I wanted to help everybody. (laughs) Even when I was paralyzed in 2016 and I was in hospital for, yeah, almost six, seven months as an inpatient then another six, seven months as an outpatient. I felt like I would wake up and I could see everything that people were doing. And I was thinking, oh, man, I want to help everybody. And towards the latter end of the last few years, I became ever so frustrated with a few of my friends who would phone me up and they would say, just be positive, stay positive. And then they would go into like solution mode, right? You got to do this. You got to do that. And you need to do this. And I found myself becoming really frustrated by this and it started to annoy me. So then I sat back one day and I said, well, if it's annoying me, maybe when you try to help people, David, it's annoying them. (laughs) And they're not telling you that you're annoying them because they're in a hospital bed next to you. So when I went into my last surgery last year, and it was November 23, the day I walked into the hospital, I walked into the ward and the neurological ward, and I seen one gentleman in one bed and I got a glimpse of another gentleman. And the first gentleman I seen, his injury was self-inflicted. So he had broke his back years ago, hadn't looked after his health, and the rods in his back broke and they severed his spinal cord. So he was paralyzed in a bed through his own mistakes, really, his own choices. And then the gentleman next to me, he had multiple tumors and cancer and was dying. So really, out things out of his control. But the first patient who was self-inflicted, he had a very fixed mindset and his locus of control was to blame the world. And the gentleman with the cancer very much what you would call a growth mindset, very positive, had a great outlook in life and was very accepting of his situation and not bitter and didn't blame the world. He took responsibility of his own actions. Every morning I woke up, the patient opposite me was the first thing I would see and he would be complaining from six in the morning to almost 11 p.m. at night. So selfishly, I realized that this is my life right now. I need him to be in a better headspace but I don't want to start telling him to do all these things. So he would lie in bed all day waiting for the physio to come to help him do his exercises. And the rest of the day, he would just lie there doing nothing. And he would look at me and I was doing all these different things, but I didn't want to tell him what to do because I thought he's not going to do because I guess maybe in our psychology for the first 18 years of our life, we're told what to do. And then we, we don't like getting told what to do after that. So I was trying to delicately manage this situation and be very empathetic and compassionate to my words that I was using to try and help him to ultimately make my environment better. But I was very careful and I realized, well, I have two ears and one mouth. So I'll ask a question and just sit and listen to him and then occasionally just try and help shift his perspective without telling them what to do. And it wasn't until the day I was leaving that he actually said to me, he says, wow, you've had a really profound impact on me. I've never looked at the world in that way. And you've sparked a little bit of curiosity in me. Like whether it was enough curiosity for him to then go and try and help himself, I'll never know. But in that little space, I thought, well, here's his, how can I look after him and protect my own energy, but also try and help people? And I find that this is a great medium to do that on podcasts. Or what I try to normally do is just redirect people to books that I've maybe read that have been quite life changing to me. So they go and read the book and hopefully they take some things from the book rather than me trying to tell people what to do. And I think that's ultimately 14 years on, I've now managed to protect my energy, but hopefully also try to help people in a more indirect way. Just as I'm listening to you, David, from all the things you've said so far, observation, the ability to notice seems paramount to you helping yourself and helping other people for that matter as well. I'm wondering. It sounds like a silly question, but what have you learned about observation and noticing? 
Well, I've learned to see the world and see people. I feel in London, very few people see other people because they're so busy. They're trying to get to their destination. They're either living in the past or living in the future. They're not connected to really in the present moment. And I know that's saved all over the self-help world. You always be in the present moment, but it, it, it is. The brain is not often designed that way to keep us in the present moment. So people don't often see people and everyone's in such a rush and such a hurry and maybe focused on their center of their world and outside their world, nothing exists. So they don't often see other things. And maybe I was guilty of this at some points as well in my life, but certainly after I was paralyzed, I learned to really find the beauty in the most simplest things, like just the change of season, the first flower that appears, the bird landing on the, the tree or the bees, or even down to a slug moving along the floor. I started to see everything. And it was dialed up massively because I realized the impermanence of life. And I think that was my superpower to realize the impermanence of life and to know that it doesn't last forever. And this is where I love going into remote countryside because it feels like time has gone on forever. I love getting bored in the countryside because it just feels like my days are going longer, which gives me longer time on this planet. And from there, I guess somehow indirectly I built a skill of observation. And I think also when you sit on the cancer wards, most people are just looking at their feet, thinking the worst. And I always try to smile to people because I know what it's like when someone smiles to me, releases all of these neurochemicals, I feel great. So on these wards, I always say to myself, okay, David, your intention today is to make somebody smile or someone laugh. So when I go to these wards and I'm a natural extrovert, I'm actually looking to speak to somebody. So I'm looking around going, right? Who wants to talk? So I started to just look at people and observe them. And because I have a natural interest in psychology and in the human being as a journey, I, I find it fascinating just to observe people. And I thought, wow, what a place to observe people on neurological wards, cancer wards, and then combine that with high performance sport and then everything in between. And I was like, wow, we're such fascinating beings and we're fascinating I don't know if we're things or whatever we are, we're so fascinating. And I just found it incredibly interesting to observe people. And that was then even more so when I was paralyzed because I go to the park and I sit in the park on a bench or a mobility scooter and I watch people move and I'm fascinated. I'm thinking, wow, does anyone understand the complexities that are happening in the mind, the central nervous system, the muscles, the skeletal system, the nervous system, just to walk through the park? And most people, unfortunately, are glued to their screens. I guess I've paid the ultimate price to learn this lesson, but that is the paradox of all of this is that, and that's when I say it, it taught me how to live. It taught me to observe. It taught me how to just appreciate. And I guess if I can ever part any lessons from all of this journey it is to try to be more connected to yourself and observe the world around you. And, and I started just observing trees and animals, and then that led to observing people and then having more compassion around how people are acting to say, well, they're on their human journey and there's so much more to the human than, than just this second interaction that we're having at this moment in time. And to try and understand that and observe it and hold space for it. It's been an incredible lesson and journey that I feel it's all, always evolving every single day. And is that what inspires you, Dave? One of the questions I was going to ask was who inspires you, but is that what inspires you? I think originally I got inspiration from watching athletes perform at the highest level and that inspired me massively to be a better athlete. But I think to understand the human, I don't look to sport for that inspiration because I'm watching technical, tactical, psychological thing unravel, but not the humanistic side of it. But when you're sitting on the cancer wards and everyone in the cancer hospital and, and in the neurological wards, they only want one thing. They only want their health and time. And then out of those wards, everyone wants everything. <laughs> I want more cars. I want a bigger house. I want more clothes. I want more medals. One's not enough. I want, I want another medal. A silver medal's not enough. I want a gold medal. And, and then there's just such a beautiful humility when you're sitting on these wards because again, you think people are all falling apart, but mostly you see this strength come from the human spirit, this will to live, will to survive, which is beautiful. There's this level of humility. Now, not everyone deals with it greatly, but the majority of people I've met have dealt with it immensely inspirational. And the gentleman on the bed next to me in the last surgery, his name was Roberto. And Roberto 
he died. And it was the most profound experience I've had in 14 years is that the doctors came in and he was presented with four options. And option four was basically to not turn off a machine, but stop assisting life. And he chose that option at 54 year old. He said, I don't want to live anymore. I'm happy for you to not assist me with oxygen anymore. So the nurse then said, well, let's prepare for end of life. And even now, I can't even process this fully. So I chose to sit and listen to this. I could have put my my headphones on and not listen to it. The gentleman in the bed, he did. He put his headphones in. It was too much for him. But I felt I wanted, me and Roberto had shared this intimacy in life through a shower curtain that was separate. I'd only ever once glanced to look at him. But every night he would scream in pain when I was trying to sleep. And I'm lying there going, oh, please, I need some quiet in here to sleep. And in the morning, Roberto would apologize. The first thing he would say is, I'm so, so sorry. And then I was like, oh, Roberto, don't say sorry. You're in so, I'm sorry you're in so much pain. I wish I could help you to ease your pain. So when the nurse said, let's prepare for end of life, there was like a rush of people coming in and out, in and out. And then what they did is they removed Roberto into his own room. And I thought I owe it to him to stand up. I want to see him. So I got up onto my Zimmer frame. I walked in my bed. They pushed him over. He stopped. It was the first time I'd really ever properly looked at him and we gazed into each other's eyes and he just he said you know don't give up and this was a man who could barely breathe and then they wheeled him out the nurse came in wiped his name off the board swept his little bay cleaned all his stuff out pulled the shower curtain back and within 30 minutes someone else was in his bay and then the next day at 12 o'clock, the resuscitation alarm went off. And then a few hours after that, a nurse came in and said, I just want to let you guys know that Roberto, Roberto's died. And his family were traveling from Italy. Some of his family didn't get to see him before he died. And they came in to see us because they had seen us every day as they were coming in to see him before they left. And that was a huge, massive, I don't even know if inspiration is the right word, but when I'm struggling to find the strength to show up each day, I often think back to that moment and I think of the impermanence of life, the fragility of it all, and that's it. Roberto's gone. He'll never get the choice to to wake up again or even have a bad day. You know, a bad day above ground is always better than a bad day below ground, right? And, you know, he's inspired me massively. And I didn't really know him as a human being. I knew he was an actor. He'd been on Downton Abbey and Game of Thrones. So he'd lived a probably a very good life but I didn't really know much else about him bar these last few moments of him on this light on this earth and that yeah that is I, I don't know how medical staff do that every day I, I would love to be a doctor but I think I would crumble I was just thinking how brave that was to share that Dave thank you for sharing that in- incredible story I often feel I don't owe Roberto anything, I guess, but if I did owe him something, it was when he said, don't give up. It's like, wow, okay, I, I'm still alive. And I think with that as well, I have to manage that because there's days where I struggle and I don't really feel like doing anything. And then I think of that conversation, I think, well, I've got to do something. And then, well, I guess also I have to have compassion for myself to be like, well, actually, David, today you are struggling emotionally and that's okay because you are dealing with some big stuff to be human being rather than human doing. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way of putting it. How has your experience reshaped your understanding of success and, and what have you learned? I think this is one I have to be so careful at because the cancer and being surrounded by all of this death, it's dialed up empathy and compassion into like a off the stratosphere. So now I just want to go around hugging people and just trying to get everyone just to be, which is... I mean, nothing would really happen in the world, right? So no one would be winning Olympic gold medals or performing. And I realized we need that high performance side because the high performance side doesn't just drive Olympians to win medals or CEOs. It also drives the medical world and, and it drives innovation and creativity and cures for cancer, for paralysis, for Alzheimer's, for MND. All of this stuff is, you need people to be driven. You need people to be pushing and waiting up every day and, and going and not just being you need them to be almost human doings as well to change the world you need someone to be the first right yeah exactly so at the moment i'm in this really strange place where i still identify massively with the first principles that drove david as an athlete but i wrestle with 
David does a cancer paralysis walk in this line of mortality and when will this happen and I struggle with that and I think I always say that success is trying to live a life and in line with your values and if you live a line with your values then that's success and showing up every day and trying to be better today as you were yesterday and for my values I value humility authenticity they're two that are really important to me as first principles and I think you can be that as an athlete the two fastest men in the world I've had the privilege of knowing and both of them are so humble and so nice okay as a competitor when they were stepping onto the track maybe you saying and Johan were fierceful competitors but I know Johan fairly well and he's the second fastest man that's ever lived and he's so humble so I think there's a way of getting that right. You can still be the greatest in sport, win everything, and still have humility as a first principle. And I think that could be installed at, at grassroots. And I, I don't know, a psychologist would probably correct me better in saying if that's nurture or nature. But I think the cancer has definitely installed a huge level of humility into me and compassion to the point where I actually want my competitors to win. <laughs> so I realized that was time to retire from competitive sport. That was the realization for me that it was time to let go of, of trying to compete at any future games because I actually wanted other people to win. <laughs> <laughs> it just reminds me, as you're talking there, about where humor plays a role as well in getting through tough times. I'm wondering how you found humor is helpful, David, if at all. No, massive. I took actually the Martin Seligman, he's one of the grandfathers of positive psychology and him and fellow psychologists came up with the VIA, the values in action, character strengths, and they identified 24 character strengths. And I did that and actually humor came out as my number one strength. And I think that's been a theme through my whole life because I remember even on the rowing team when we were out doing sessions at seven in the morning, 18K in a, in a pair or whatever, I was always the funny one. I was always the one that didn't take us serious. I was always the bit of the joker yeah. of the team. And that's been through that through all my sports. And no matter where in life, I've always been the little bit of the joker and always seen, like, I guess, the more lighter side of it. And that has paid massive benefits in surgery and the dark humor in the hospitals, especially in the spinal hospital. To be honest with you, it's what got me through. The things that were happening, if I didn't laugh, I think I would have just broke down. So I think humor is still my number one character strength. And I just, again, with the character strengths, you can either underuse them or overuse them. So it goes back to observation to be able to read the room and know when it's appropriate. But I, I feel that sometimes my situation when I'm talking to my family about my death and stuff, it can be quite, that's quite an intense conversation to have. And sometimes I don't often get it right. And the humor is not the best thing to use in that point. But at other times it's helped me massively. And it's also helped those around me. Just sometimes it takes the elephant out of the room if I do something that's related to a spinal cord injury, which can be quite embarrassing. And it happens. I lean on humor to just ease the situation in the room. So here's a question to you, David. Given that Sarah was supporting you when you were in sport, Sarah, you're supporting many other people these days with your knowledge on sleep and so on. David, have you got any top tips, things you'd like to share with Sarah that you think would be helpful for her to be able to pass on to some of those people she works with today? She passed all her wisdom on to me, so I'd just be passing it back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> top tips. Like I always say, be where your feet are. That for me is such a big thing to be in the present moment. And I feel like it's cliche to say that be where your feet are. That's where the magic happens and try to connect more to nature and less to technology. Technology is not going away. And I think it's an amazing thing, but just trying to understand and manage our relationship with it and impermanence. I guess like these are things that lots of people know, but impermanence is I've changed the word. There's a thing called memento mori, which is a meditation of your own death. And if you're born and you're lucky to live to 80, you're given 4,000 weeks. I think that's 960 or 920 months. If, we, if we're not in Somac and we sleep for 23 years, we'll spend 23 years of those 4,000 weeks asleep. And then so many hours a day in a queue, so many hours a day scrolling, that turns into years. So then it leaves us with this window of maybe 20 years where you can really do our the stuff that lights us and makes us passionate. And that's if you're lucky to get 4,000 weeks. Not many of us get that luck of 4,000 weeks. So then we have even less time to fulfill things that really light us and create that burning feeling in our bodies that we love what we do and 
I truly believe that trying to find something in life that you love what you do is super important. And I know many people don't have that luxury and that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, the impermanence is a big one for me. Well, I think during what you said there, that there's a whole number of weeks and years that we spend sleeping. Maybe Sarah also, if you're helping people to get better quality sleep, then their life will be enhanced during that time as well. Oh, for sure. And Dave's point about not getting lost in the technology and being in the moment certainly helps with sleep. Just subjectively assessing how you feel in the morning. Are you alert? Are you refreshed? Are you productive? You don't need to necessarily get hung up on data and gadgets and gizmos, be in tune with your body. And I think from the sleep side, that's certainly one of the key messages from what Dave said this morning. There are lots of lots of key things to take from what Dave said this morning, but certainly in terms of the sleep is just being in tune with your body and knowing how you're feeling on a day-to-day basis. And that presence of mind is critical. Mm, so important. So David, I know that you've recorded a lot of podcasts and other content out there on the internet, and you have a website that people can see some of that in. If they want to find out more about you, how might they do that on the internet? I'm only active on Instagram and on LinkedIn. It's just David Smith MBE and I have stuff there and then other podcasts and I I write a weekly column for the Herald newspaper in Scotland. So yeah, that's the best way to reach me. And I do read every message and I do try to reply to everyone as well. So yeah, if you're passing by, stop in and say hello on any of those platforms and I'm there. Fantastic. Well, we'll put links to those on our show notes for this episode today. I found it hugely inspiring speaking to you, David. I think your self-awareness and your knowledge and understanding of high performance as a human being is really amazing. So I wish you well and that your messages, I'm sure, will inspire our listeners too. And thank you, Sarah, for bringing this wonderful guest to our podcast today. And what did you make of what you heard? Well, as ever, Dave loves to talk (laughs) and everything he says like I said at the start is insightful and will be impactful on people listening and I really hope that people take away those messages of being in the moment because Dave's right it's so important and you can learn a lot from the high performance environment and obviously that can lead to success but life is for living and being in the moment is key David Thank you so much for having me on and it's been great to chat with you, Sue, and also Sarah. We spent lots of time together in a very high-pressured environment, so it's great to see all the work that you've gone on to do in, in the sleep world. And I do read your stuff very closely and I'm still trying to improve my sleep hygiene, so I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. It's good to keep in touch. No, thank you, guys. Well, thanks to David and Sarah for the insightful and inspiring conversation. And if you enjoyed it, then maybe you'll know somebody else who you also think might enjoy this. So we'd appreciate if you can share it with them and then help more people to gain benefit from the Access to Inspiration podcast. And if you've enjoyed this series, then why not show your appreciation and click on the Buy Me A Coffee link on the show notes to make a small donation. This show is free to listen to, but not free to make. And your support really encourages us to continue producing quality audio content. We'll be taking a break over the next few weeks to meet more amazing people and create the next series. So make sure you subscribe or follow us so that you'll know when that's available for you. Until then, why not listen to some of our back catalogue and be inspired by some other episodes? And I look forward to connecting with you again soon.